Close to Call is a sports talk radio show brought to you by Kevin Mahalik, featuring commentary on the week's biggest sports news and events and engaging behind-the-scenes player interviews. While specializing in Philadelphia sports, Too Close to Call will also discuss issues and events happening on a national scale. Too Close to Call airs Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. Boston Scott, shipping up to Boston Scott, we're shipping up, right to the playoffs, let's go baby, aloha and hello out there, how's everybody doing, I'm fantastic, thanks for asking, I appreciate it, welcome to today's edition of Too Close to Call Sports, your sports talk radio show here at Usula Media and Usula Radio, I'm your host as always, Kevin Mahalik, I appreciate you guys tuning in once again today, and yet again another very energetic intro, because the Philadelphia Eagles keep playing good football, they keep on winning. Winning. They advanced to the playoffs this year. Playoffs? We're talking playoffs? We were 5-7 and seven losing to the Dolphins on the road, and you guys were in here talking about playoffs? Yeah, that's gosh darn right I was, ladies and gentlemen. I told you from October, through that tough stretch of six games, all they had to do was go 2-4, and four, and right there it was going to be at the end of the year for us. Now, yes, we do have to write a thank you letter to the Buffalo Bills, because Thanksgiving night, They beat the Dallas Cowboys, which then allowed us to lose that game to Miami and still control our own destiny with the last forward. But voila, that happened. Here we are. I don't give a darn that Washington's picking second, the Giants are picking eighth, and there were a combined, I don't know, seven and whatever the heck the math is, the 32 there, 25. So I don't care. Four in a row is four in a row. This is the NFL. We're NFC East champs, and we are heading to the playoffs. What a weekend it was. My goodness, ladies and gentlemen, and once again, as we're watching the game as fans, people reporting on the team, people covering the team, we're just watching the walking wounded continue. I I feel like, what is that, the walking dead on uh, on AMC or A&E that's happening? I feel like the Eagles are auditioning for the walking dead season 12 or whatever season they're on. I mean, my gosh, there was a time we were watching the game and the announcer said there was a line into the medical tent. Like, I forget who it was, um, Avante Maddox, I think, couldn't come back into the game yet because he was currently waiting in line for the blue tent and Brandon Graham was already in there. It was unbelievable just to see this continue to happen and uh, the reason I chose that intro this week shipping up to Boston was my man Boston Scott. Shout out to Boston first and foremost. He was named NFC Offensive Player of the Week. That happened uh, yesterday or or earlier this morning. I forget exactly when it came out for you but uh, kudos to Boston Scott out of Louisiana Tech. uh, A practice squad player uh, for the New Orleans Saints they spoke about on uh, on the telecast how he was with the Saints and uh, the 2000 or not 2000 201st pick and then the Eagles picked him up and uh, with Miles Sanders cruising early on we thought it was going to be another one of those weekends where the the birds are just riding Miles Sanders if you look at the box score here let me do it quick for you uh, Miles had nine carries for 52 yards and 5.8 a pop so certainly having a heck of a game a heck of a first quarter and then ultimately comes down with an ankle sprain and it was interesting when we were watching it live you could see it it actually happened the play before I think everybody thinks it does because he ran an out route where he caught the ball and he kind of got tackled a little awkwardly was slow to get up but then they showed the replay and none of his ankles or none of his parts really got tucked underneath anybody which led me to believe that because of the hurry up offense he didn't want to come off the field and it just the ball happened to find him while he was nursing an ankle injury but the uh, the good news out of uh, you know Doug Peterson this week, he said yesterday in his press conference that uh, it's a low ankle sprain. And then you guys listening out there are probably like, Kev, what the hell's the difference? It's an ankle. An ankle's an ankle. Low ankle, high ankle. No, there really is a difference when it comes to athletics, basketball, football, any any sport where you really have to cut, jump, and move quickly. You know, baseball, you can kind of get away with it just because it's a lot of slower uh, movements. But the high ankle sprain, typically what they're referencing there is if you feel your ankle, you feel that bone. And 
And anything above that bone is typically a high ankle sprain, and anything below that bone is a, a low ankle sprain. And the reason you want it to be more of a low ankle sprain is because it's easier to, to uh, you know, create stability within the ankle or the foot the lower it gets obviously more in your shoe you can you know just walk in standard with shoes or without shoes obviously there's more you know protection with shoes so they can do a lot of things in regards to the shoe tape everything like that that is still allows you mobility uh, but can kind of maintain the swelling and the pain that you're going through so my man's going to be doing a lot of hot and cold tubs this week been in there from you know 30 degrees into 100 degrees back and forth to increase blood flow increase the muscles, get it going. Uh, he's going to do a lot of work in the pool this week because they're going to want to keep the body weight off of it. However, they're going to want to maintain uh, you know, conditioning, and, and he's going to join Lane Johnson, who you guys have seen on social media, been in the pool, working on things. So uh, I expect him to be back this upcoming weekend. I obviously don't think he's going to be 100%. There's no way he's going to be 100%. I mean, it's six days later. Granted, the Eagles caught a break because they're the late game on Sunday, so whatever it's worth, it's an extra 24 Four hours, and you know, if he goes from 75 to 79 percent, hell, I'll take it, right? You know, take everything you can get there, that's for sure. But ultimately, like we said, Boston Scott coming in and this Eagles offense not missing a beat was one of the more impressive things that I've seen on the fly when it comes to this team this year because a lot of times they've had trouble adjusting to injuries in-game uh, or, or positional movements in-game, and that's certainly understandable because you practice all week with one set of personnel and one set of you know advantages. This is what these guys do well, and then all of a sudden you got to change it. Well, we haven't practiced any of this, Coach. What the heck do you mean we're doing in this now. I don't know what's going on here, but uh, you know, Boston and Miles very similar in, in the way that the, they were used within the Eagles offense. Uh, again, they weren't able to miss a clip. If you look it up here, uh, Boston Scott, once again the player of the week due to his three touchdowns on the ground, had 54 yards rushing, a 2.8 average. Not the strongest, but really where he excelled uh, was in the passing game, in the receiving game, particularly in the screen game late there in the game. He had a long screen down to the you know two or three Three yard line. Uh, he had another swing pass screen type of type of play where they like to get him in space, get him the ball quick. Because one of his touchdowns came from one yard out after the defensive play of the game, the low snap strip sack fumble from Malcolm Jenkins. And we'll get into Malcolm a little bit longer because I have some stats that you guys may have read on Twitter. But if you haven't seen them, you got to hear these because they're unbelievably impressive. But um, you know, he gets it from the one next play, boom, one yard touchdown. That's obviously going to hurt your yards per carry average, but hell, you'll take that every time. So the, the, the surprise that I had hinted at earlier was Jordan Howard not getting any run whatsoever. I think he was in there for one play. I'd have to look back at the official snap counts. I don't have those in front of me, but it was under five, and the play I remember him being in for was one because Boston just ran the ball like three times in a row. Dude needed a hit of water. You know, I need a break on the sideline here, but uh, it was a play-action pass where Jordan was just kind of there. You know, he wasn't really blocking. He wasn't really out in the route. He would just, you know, fake run. Hey, kind of hang out if anybody gets close. Hit him for me. So I don't know if it was that he's not in football shape and Doug, you know, really didn't want to use him or that he was medically cleared with the shoulder nerve thing that's going on. And he personally didn't feel a hundred percent or want to get hit because my understanding or my thinking is obviously, you know, transitioning here. If you did win the game, which they did, and now you're in the playoffs. I think you're going to need Jordan Howard to, to give you something. I, I mean, Boston Scott's been excellent. Again, Miles Sanders, especially now with the ankle injury, but those five, six, seven carries, third and short, second and short, move the chains, kind of continue to pound the defense, maintain ball control. I think that's really going to be key this weekend, and that's something Jordan Howard is going to have to do, and we haven't seen it in seven, eight weeks now. It's been two months since you know I was here banging on the table saying, pay the man, ends up getting a stinger nerve average, and here we are going, can he even play? What's going on? So uh, a total swing there for, for Jordan. But uh, Boston has certainly earned his touches. He's obviously option 1-1-B, one, one depending on Sanders' health, uh, specifically you know, in the passing game, in the screen game. So something to look, uh, you know, look at there if Howard is able to make it back this weekend. But continuing through the offense, Boston Scott, but also obviously we can't go too long here. I like to not lead the show with it since all the other Philadelphia Eagles, podcasts, media's coverage. Coverage is we all live on number 11. 
Carson Wentz, everybody wants to talk about whether he's good, whether he's bad. You kind of lead with that. And I feel like it, you know, you, you don't get to everybody else on the team and, and the contributions that they're making. So, um, but Carson, once again, another fantastic football game. Uh, he managed the game excellently. That doesn't mean he was a game manager. It just means that he didn't turn the ball over. He didn't force any passes into, you know, tight windows, double coverage. There was one play where he threw the go route into double coverage, but, you know, it was third down, kind of a punt situation. So, uh, you know, a little mental awareness from him there knowing, hey, even if this is an interception, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, Time to take chances. Those are the times. Uh, But overall, 23 of 40, 289, one touchdown, three carries for 15 yards. And and that's one difference in Carson's game, uh, specifically even against the Cowboys, where they used him more in the read option game. He had a few more carries there. I don't know if it's one of those, hey, it's now week 16, 17. Let's let the guy kind of do his thing a little bit more. Let's run him. I hope that's not the case because when it comes to injuries, you'd rather have it happen week one so he misses this year because if somebody bangs an ace CL first round of the playoffs, they're done for all of next year. So you're starting to get into that conversation. I think, honestly, it's it's just a feel thing for the game. And, and I think Carson is one of those quarterbacks that needs to get hit a little bit to feel like he's in the flow of the game and, and he's he's learning defensively what they're trying to do. And, and that's where he's been going through his reads, tucking and going. So against Dallas, they ran a little bit more of the read option. But against New York, there were two or three plays we watched in the film for you guys where he went one, two, they're not there. Let me take it off and go. Instead of continuing to try to read three, four, and five, they're probably not open based on the talent at those positions that we've talked about. Now, if your fifth option is is Deshaun Jackson on the backside. Yeah, maybe you look at that. But if option one is Ertz, two's Goddard, three's Ward, and none of those guys are there, I'm totally fine with tucking, running it, man, holding on to the football, maybe getting two, three yards. You know, not any huge plays. We're not talking Lamar Jackson out here, Michael Vick taking it to the house. But second and seven is a hell of a lot better than second and 14 because he's taking a sack and kind of going through his read. So Dougie really kind of got elementary and said, hey, listen, one, two, go. You know, one, two, three, go. I need you to tuck and go. You're athletic enough to keep us ahead of the down and distances and, and you know, continue to allow us to execute and score 34 points again. You know, they had 30-something against Washington two weeks ago. Dallas, obviously a little bit tougher defense, but uh, 17 could have been more, uh, you know, a couple different opportunities they had to put that even further out of reach, but uh, 34 again against the Giants. So this offense is starting to find its footing, and a lot of it stems uh, from that play calling and allow Carson Wentz to do what he's actually good at. But in relation to you know the Seattle Seahawks, who everybody knows is coming to town, unbelievable how you know we end up with Seattle watching that game Sunday night against the Niners. Seattle coming up, I think it was like four inches short, literally. First of all, had the first and goal delay of game, all that good stuff. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about the rest of the playoff picture later in the program today. But uh, referencing Seattle, obviously f- first and foremost with your Philadelphia Eagles, uh, it, it really comes down to throwing the game film out from six weeks ago. I, yeah, these are two totally different teams that are playing each other. You know, looking back at that game, that was the game where they started Andre Dillard at right tackle instead of Big V. Obviously, that was a mistake and a, and a mess and a turn style. He couldn't play that side, which, you know, he'll be fine. It's not like, hey, the kid can't play. It was just he can't play the right side. 10 months after learning the left side and never playing the right side. So uh, that led to five turnovers from the Eagles, three or four fumbles from Wentz, one or two more on a, you know, miscommunication on a handoff style of, uh, you know, turnover for them. And, and really, I think a lot of that stuff is going to be cleaned up because they haven't shown that since those games, since the Patriots game, since the Seattle game. Uh, You know, these last four weeks in the division, they've really taken care of the football, and and it's been one of the reasons they've been able to win these games. You know, the last two weeks having positive turnover ratios, like we discussed against New York, they get the one low snap uh, on the the particular play where they have the all-out blitz called. Malcolm Jenkins gets in there, Nigel Bradham's in there, and... You know what? Before we dive into Seattle here, let me touch on Malcolm Jenkins. I just want to—I want to read you guys these stats because I don't want to miss these. These are just unbelievable statistics for the game of football. It really is. So, Malcolm Jenkins, obviously. Uh, let's see. I'm pulling up the article here. I just want to make sure I get them right for you guys. But Malcolm turned 32 10 days ago, so 32 years old now. And this year, he played all 74 snaps against the Giants, which then means he played all 1,034 defensive snaps 
this year for the Eagles. So over a thousand snaps without missing one. And that's the second straight year he hasn't missed a play. And then if you go back even further, since the 17 playoffs, since the Super Bowl run, he has played 2,420 consecutive snaps. 420, nice. Haha. <laughs> 2,420 consecutive snaps. That's unbelievable. And like I said, since he got here in 14, he's played 6,754 out of 6,845. The guy's missed under 100 snaps in for what, five years now. Oh, and uh, you know, that's just defensive snaps. Don't don't even mention the 933 snaps he played on special teams. And and he made another special teams tackle against the Giants. The, you know, the announcer pointed out, hey, there's a Pro Bowl all pro making a, a tackle on special teams for you. But that's unbelievable to play 99% of snaps over the course of five years. I, I had a roommate in college, Will Rackley. You guys can Google him. He was a third-round pick at a Lehigh University for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And this isn't in a shot at Will in any way. Will made it four years in the not-for-long league. I believe I had Will on the, on the pod for you guys a few weeks back, played that interview we did with him. But, you know, first year, made it 13 games, got an ankle rolled up on, missed the last couple. Second year, played 15, a little banged up. Third year, concussion early on, played like three or four. And it's just, that's what happens when you play football for a guy to just not have an injury or or not tweak a hammy or a muscle. I mean, just think of all the injuries we've had this year and last year. Last year we were the walking wounded too and and Malcolm continues to just play every game, every snap continues to play at a high level. Uh, look for him to obviously get a contract extension this offseason. I know during the bye week there was some rumors uh, that Lane Johnson, Zach Ertz, and Malcolm Jenkins were the three individuals uh, that they were looking at to extend and, and kind of alleviate that cap pick next year, really get them back on point uh, you know, to where they deserve to be paid and all of that jazz. So, But Malcolm, obviously, with the Ironman streak, that's huge for the secondary. That is banged up again on the outside. We talked about getting these guys back back. Now they're playing better. Well, they're gone again. You know, Ronald Darby, he's out again. Jalen Mills looks to be back for the playoffs. He sat out this past week. I don't know if it's the foot again. Maybe, maybe not. You know, lower body type of thing, but ultimately it's going to be Mills out there. Probably Rasul Douglas on the other side, which gives me a a little bit of pause, you know, transitioning back into uh, Seattle Seahawks talk here and, and what to look for this upcoming Sunday. But Obviously, Seattle with uh, DK Metcalf, the uh, the superhuman himself for all of you uh, NFL fans who follow year round. He was the gentleman who showed up to the combine with I think it was fourteen abs, sixteen abs, whatever the hell he had. He was just ripped, and he's like, so let's see here, six four two thirty wide receiver, one running a four three out there. And, you know, there was the, uh, the the viral clip of Pete Carroll took his shirt off when he met him in the meeting room to try to, like, one-up him and whatnot. But it really is amazing. The only thing with DK is every now and then he has trouble catching the football. So he will get open. He will get deep. Hell, even against the Eagles, Week 12, he dropped that touchdown in the end zone. Yeah, it was a little bit, you know, thrown inside, so he had to turn off the route. But off his fingertips, a, a catch that could have been made. So uh, the reason I bring him up, obviously, he's big, he's fast, he's strong. Jalen Mills is a little bit small, more of a physical wide receiver. Uh, We saw Rasul Douglas clearly had the bullseye on his back uh, against the Giants. They went after him three, four, five different times. He got beat once or twice, and Daniel Jones underthrew the football. You know, I'm screaming at him, turn around, and instead it just hits him right in the back. You know, but that's how they're coached to continue to try to close. You can't assume the ball is going to be underthrown. You just got to try to close as quick as you can. It's just from a fan's perspective, you wish you could just get in their ear real quick and be like, oh, dude, turn around. You're like, come on. Oh, God damn it. Right off the back of your helmet. Come on. Uh, just So Mills, Douglas, uh, you know, Sidney Jones, another interception on a play where he may or may not have gotten beat a little bit. It looked like he had safety help over the top, so he was playing a little bit more technique. Um, uh, technique and positioning. I almost said technicianing. Is any I just mix the two of them, put them together. Uh, technique and positioning. You know, using the sidelines as a as a third defender. Uh, ultimately, got the interception. So it's another one thing with Sidney Jones. What what I like to do, ladies and gentlemen, occasionally is kind of put myself in the shoes of the other team's perspective. So you know, when you're going through online, you're reading your blogs or your your reporters, your articles, however you like to kind of get your Eagles news, I like to take that same approach 
for whoever it is we're playing, like Seattle Seahawks, and, and kind of go, you know, see what their blogs are, see what they're writing about the Eagles and, and how they're feeling, because we could be feeling a totally different way than the opposing team. And, and one of the things that jumped out as I was reading an article was that, uh, according to Seattle, Sidney Jones is starting to assert himself and really become a breakout player in Philadelphia's secondary. Well, Seattle, uh, Sidney Jones played one snap against the Washington Redskins or Giants. I forget which one, but that was the one he knocked down in the end zone late in the game. It was literally his only snap. Then uh, two weeks later, I think he played three or five snaps. Once again, went at him one more time. That was the Dallas game. (laughs) They went at him back-to-back times with Cooper and then Gallup. He made the play both times. Against the Giants, he's only getting some run because we got uh, Avante Maddox gets dinged up. He's day-to-day, should be okay. But all of a sudden, you get another horrible pass. You get an interception on a play where... Uh, you know, he, he was probably beat, but oh, look at that. Three plays in four weeks. Now, all of a sudden, you're in ascending corner who's breaking out of the bust label, according to the opposing team. And I got news for you. If they're scared of Sidney, you know, oh my God, I can't even, I don't know, Sidney Jones, Sidney Douglas. If they're scared of Sidney Jones, I don't even know what to tell them. That's just, I, I, I laughed when I read that bullet point. I felt like commenting, like, hey, guy. He stinks. Go at him. You don't want him in the game. So, but we'll see. He, he's made some plays the last couple of weeks. I'll give him credit for there. I, I am not, I am certainly one of the Sidney Jones haters. You know, you could probably put me in that category if you're looking to, to position me, but truly uh, good for him. And, and we're going to need him again with all these injuries. It's not like he's not going to get on the field here late. So, uh, but that gets back to Seattle's offense as a whole. And, and, you know, DK Metcalf obviously being a big part of Seattle's offense, but Seattle likes to run the football. They are a run-oriented offense, very much run-heavy. We've seen it in years past. They were number one in run-to-pass distribution, play-call distribution. And it's been a little bit of a struggle with them, obviously losing all three of their top running backs, which led to uh, beast mode returning for the first time in 14 months. He he scored a touchdown, but, uh, you know, did look a little bit out of it. Obviously, he's not in football shape. Uh, You can be in great shape physically, but it doesn't matter, you know, mean you're in football shape in particular. So each week that goes by, he'll be in a a little bit better and better shape, probably get more and more touches, uh, more and more plays on the field. But really, it all starts from the run, and then they go play action with Russell Wilson off of the running. And Russell is, is one of those guys who, similar to Carson Wentz doesn't turn the football over, doesn't throw interceptions. Uh, he honestly doesn't fumble a lot. You know, Carson fumbles. You don't hear that with Russ. He, he really controls the football, plays to his strengths, manages the game, tries to get it into the fourth quarter, and knows that he can make a play late in the football game. It almost happened against San Francisco. They got the ball back, having to drive the length of the field with a couple minutes left. Bang, bang, boom. They're at the one-yard line. Uh, Pete Carroll still doesn't know that if you're inside the one, you can literally just hand the ball to Marshawn Lynch to get a touchdown. You know, he keeps doing this delay of game, throw the ball. It never really works out. So uh, hopefully that'll be a, a third time's the charm. If we get there this weekend and he won't learn and just give the ball to, to Skittles there to beast mode to try to get in and, and make a play. But that's where defensively uh, the Eagles were, at, were able to get after Russell Wilson the first time. They had six sacks in that game. And, uh, you know, it's because uh, the, the Seahawks are banged up too. You know, they're coming in with their own problems. I have here, uh, they're hoping to get safety Quandre Diggs back. He was the guy they traded for from the Lions in the middle of the year. Michael Kendricks tore his ACL. Our old friend Michael, uh, you know, healthy recovery to you, but he's obviously done for the year. Maybe next, you know, case in point where it comes to possibly next. So they'll insert a rookie out of Utah, Cody Barton, into the linebacker crew, which, you know, could be a, um, a matchup to look for. Obviously, Dallas Goddard, Zach Ertz, squarely on the bubble with whether or not he's going to be able to get out there. But um, Dallas Goddard against Cody Barton could be something to look out for. Uh, but left tackle Dwayne Brown, he's a, he's a pro for them. Doesn't look like he's going to go. He had surgery not too long ago. They're saying he's going to give it everything he's got. So don't be surprised until he's not out there, you know, whether or not he's actually going to go. But uh, all those sacks last year due to the, or excuse me, six weeks ago, due to the deep drops that uh, Russell Wilson takes. And and, and that's the offense. And I, w- I was looking at it here, researching, kind of looking at the, um, the Seahawks 49ers game from this past Sunday. And the Niners... They blitzed 
a little bit more than usual. And, and the reason I was kind of taking a look at this is because Jim Schwartz doesn't like to blitz himself. He likes to get pressure with his front four, play seven back, cover you, be able to get there. Uh, and, and there's times where he hasn't been able to this year. And to his credit, he's brought in more pressure than I, than I thought he would. So the Niners typically do this as well. But it was interesting to see uh, against Russell Wilson specifically. Um, passing plays, let's see here, 39 total. Okay, so versus the Blitz, 9 of 18, 86 yards for a 63.7 passer rating. So 50% completion, under 100 yards, passer rating in the 60s. Not good for Russell. That's eh, that's that's with the Blitz. So you say, okay, we got to bring people because uh, versus non-Blitz, 16 of 21, a buck 47 and a touchdown for a 126.5 passer rating. So literally double the passer rating, almost double the yards, and certainly a better completion percentage. If you let Russell Wilson just drop back, he's going to beat you. He's good enough to be able to read the defense. If you're in zone, understand where the opening is, hit his guy there. And if you're in man-to-man, he's got mismatches out there, such as DK Metcalf, where he's throwing it up because he's not taking a sack. At the very least, he's going to give his guy a shot, put it in the right place. Uh, You know, If he misses it, it's wrong. Only his guy can catch it and things like that. So you're going to need to come after him. You're going to need to get him on the ground. That's the other thing. When you do come after him, you need to maintain discipline in your rushing lanes. That means that even though you are rushing the passer, you have to understand gap responsibility. Like we've talked about, center to guard A outside, you know, as you go outside A, B, C, D. So if you're in the C gap and you're rushing the passer, even if you see an opportunity all the way around here, you can't go there because then that'll leave that gap wide open. And even if you get there, Russell's good enough to go right through that opening. So you need to maintain your lanes and not allow him any easy escapes to extend the play or run the football. And that's something they did very well the first time through. So, um, Pulling up here the last couple of minutes, some of these Facebook groups I posted in, I wanted to see what everybody was thinking, uh, you know, what their biggest concern was for this weekend. We got a couple of responses, one from uh, Zach Rubright out there. Zach, hopefully I got your last name right, but Zach says, literally stop Russ. That's it. I have no fear of Seattle besides maybe DK getting one or two good catches. Contain Russell Wilson in all capital letters. And then we have uh, another gentleman here who literally, let's see, uh, Daniel Zachary. He said pretty much the same thing. Obviously, the defense stopping Russell Wilson. Uh, then he did make a comment about Foles and Wentz. Uh, that's hilarious. Obviously, like we touched on, everything there can be wiped out. Carson Wentz, truly the guy. Uh, you know, you need to be you need to be putting your stuff behind. But that was another thing here. Just real quick, ladies and gents, like I do, I, I jump all around here, but I'm pulling my phone out. I want to make sure I get this for you. How about this one, Dylan? And, and in instance number 7,432,312 of Las Vegas having a time machine, the over-under for passing yards this season on Carson Wentz. Okay, let me do it. Let me do it this way. The, uh, all right, here we go. The over-under on passing yards, Carson Wentz, 4,040 and a half. So 4040.5. Now we all know Carson was the first 4000 yard passer in Eagles history. Well, how many yards did he end with, you ask? 4039. He was under by a yard and a half. How the hell does Vegas get within a yard of a half of Passing yards. That's insane. That's one guy falling forward instead of backwards. Like, over under money. Like, that's unbelievable. How do they average that with any yard? And as well as touchdowns, 28 and a half. He had 27. So, one and a half there. So, figure your shit out, Vegas. Should have been 28. Come on. You're way off there. That's unbelievable. 40-40, and he had 40-39. That just, that blows my mind. It's one of the, like, they have they have a time machine. It's not a big deal. That's cool. You could tell us now. It's 2019. We understand. We're on the social media. We'd we'd get it if you were time traveling. Not a big deal, but what a number there. So ultimately, ladies and gents, wrapping this up about the birds. Phenomenal year from Carson Wentz. Everybody shut up about Foles. Uh, Wentz can play. You've seen it. He's continued to improve these last four, five, six weeks. We've yelled at him. I told him he needed to do some adjustments. He's done those. Things have improved. Uh, the defense the last month and a half since that Miami game has been a hell of a lot better. At home specifically, they give up in the teens. So I don't think Seattle's going to come in here and you know walk all over us in any any way like I did last time. You know, Last time I took them to win between uh, 8 and 14. 
18. You know, this time I, it's going to be a little bit lower than that. But um, the line came out at first with the Eagles with a slight favorite. That flipped in about 20 minutes when everybody realized what the hell was going on. Now it's Seattle minus two, two and a half depending on where you're looking at it or what you're finding there. I've seen both of them. I think that's about right. Touchdown favorite. Obviously, the 17-9 game six weeks ago, eight points, but it was 17-3 to until like the last play of the game. If you remember, they scored really, really late in that game. But you know, ultimately, it comes down to the offensive line, protecting Carson Wentz, protecting the football, and being able to run the ball. And that's where it comes down to the O-line, the big uglies. I hate to say it. It's 17 weeks of glamorous football, ladies and gentlemen. And then it's going to be the offensive line and the defensive line that wins this playoff game. Defensive line needs to maintain their lanes, get after Russell Wilson, contain him. He's going to hit his plays. Contain him. Get him on the ground. Tim Jernigan continue to play really good football. Fletcher Cox, he's played the best month, continues to get healthier and healthier. Offensively, Got to keep, got to keep Carson upright. Those five, six sacks led to fumbles. All of that stuff from last time. Got to keep him upright. And then if Sanders can't go, Boston Scott, Jordan Howard, just staying on time in the downed and distances. No, no, don't need the big plays. Need second and six. I need third and two, third and four, second and seven. We can't have second and tens. You know, first down and complete turn into uh, second and longs and things like that. But going to be a heck of a football game this weekend down there at Lincoln Financial on Sunday. The nine and seven Philadelphia Eagles host the eleven and five Seattle Seahawks at four forty. Get out there if you're going early. Get excited. Be loud. Make it happen. But uh, you know, either way, next Tuesday we're going to have something spectacular to talk about. Out, whether it's the end of the year pod or you know show for the birds or if we're talking round two and possibly heading to San Francisco either way stick around with us guys we're gonna love doing that but we're gonna pause here real quickly for a word from our sponsors uh, on the flip side we're gonna stick with Philly sports this time we're gonna jump on the flyers and sixers quick then we'll wrap up the last one you know talking NFL playoffs college football playoffs all that action but stick with us here for just a second appreciate it From the kids to Aunt Sue. Keep your whole family connected on all their devices with crowd-pleasing gig-speed internet from Xfinity. Now that's simple, easy, awesome. Learn more about gig-speed internet or other popular plans now with even more speed. Enjoy faster downloads and a better streaming experience today. Go to Xfinity.com, call 1-800-XFINITY, or visit an Xfinity store for a great offer. Restrictions apply. Actual speeds vary and not guaranteed. everybody here it's a beautiful new year's eve the last day in 2019 the last day of the decade what does that mean it's the 3650th day of the decade hey look at that quick math for everybody out there bada bing bada boom coming at you but oh man new year's eve tonight new year's tomorrow can't wait to start another year waking up feeling like crap all hung over, saying, I'll start my stuff tomorrow. That whole getting in shape, stop smoking. Ah, it's, I can't. I can't. It's before noon. I feel like crap. What time's the football on? Seriously, though, like, we go into the new year every year of like, hey, new year, new me. Obviously, I'm dropping 10 to 15 pounds this year like I have every year in the past. That truly obviously comes true. But, you know, and then you just booze your way through the night, wake up feeling like crap and don't do a gosh darn thing on the first day of the year anyway. So I may try something different. You know, I may take it a little easy. Get my butt out of bed tomorrow. Maybe do something cool. But uh, December 31st, just past half past one, just past half past one, just past half past one. It's uh, 135 here, and we're talking Philly sports, where the uh, the Flyers and Sixers are both on the road because apparently, according to Wells Fargo, Mickey Mouse takes uh, takes top notch here, top precedent. You got, you're going, Mickey Mouse, Kev, what the hell are you talking about? It's a sports show. Well, Disney on Ice is currently occupying the Wells Fargo Center for the last two weeks. And I've seen some video of the people there. Moana on ice looks spectacular, Dylan. I'm not going to lie. Seeing Big Maui out there on the ice. Uh, What is it? Thank you. Isn't that the song? No, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You know, he's out there just cruising around. And I'm like, no, I want a home game. I hate the West Coast. I don't want to watch hockey at one in the morning when they stink anyway. But, uh, you know, quick segment here. Talking Sixers, Flyers. Obviously, with Christmas, uh, the Flyers. 
Flyers, like we spoke about last week, they had a slower week this week. They had the week off, and then now they're on the road trip for six straight. Uh, they started off in San Jose, losing 6-1 to one to the Sharks last Saturday. Oh, man, Jesus, that was just a poop game. It really was. Justin Braun, a homecoming for him. Uh, Carter Hart got beat up. Carter really struggles, uh, I'm coming to find, when... He, he can't find a rhythm because they had, four, like I said, four, five, six days off here. You travel across the country. You have days off from practice because you're with your family, obviously, for Christmas, the holidays. And, and you, you just kind of lose that flow, the, the organic kind of routine or flow that happens with every other day, every third day, every travel. When you, you get a week off, you kind of reset. And it's good mentally overall for the body, 100%. But it's kind of staying hot so to speak, is difficult. And, and Carter seems to be one of those goalies where if something's just a little bit off, you know, it, it kind of takes everything off the rails. But if it's not, he's spectacular. So he'll continue to kind of find his way through that stuff. Obviously, I think he's 20 years old. So, you know, he's never gone through a week off during games for the holidays. You know, he's playing in college or overseas somewhere. So, um, He'll bounce back. I think he'll be fine. They play tonight against the LA Kings. The Kings are not what they once were. You know, everybody's going, oh, the Kings, they won like three cups or something like that. But yeah, no, they're not great anymore. That's a game they can win. Uh, after that, they head to Las Vegas, which is a good hockey team. So that's going to be a tough one. And then Saturday at the Phoenix, now Arizona Coyotes. So three more road games. Uh, the second trip here, I, I jumped over this one, but they played a back-to-back -back Saturday, Sunday, and they bounced back and beat the Ducks. Ducks fly together. They beat the, the Ducks 2-1 to one, and they were down 30 seconds into the game. So I want to give a shout out to the coaching staff and the players on that team there because even me as a fan, they lose 6-1 to one Saturday. Sunday football's on, right? We're watching the Birds 4-7, 8 o'clock, and then you get a night game with the Ducks. I'm going, okay, let me put this on. Well, they give up a goal 30 seconds in after getting their butts kicked 6-1 to one, and I'm going, I'm out of here. I, I'm not watching this again. I can't. I'm, I'm, I'll watch the replay. Sure as crap, right? Here they come back, tie it up later in the first, end up winning the game in overtime. Kevin Hayes continues to be a, a solid signing uh, for Chucky Fletcher there. And, and Brian Elliott, strong, man. Just another strong game. It's, it's really wild how both the Flyers and the Sixers. Did I write the Sixers one down? I don't think I did. But you guys know what it is out there. The, the home-to-road splits for these two teams. I don't know what the heck's going on. Because even the Flyers, and this is a team that it, it's typically not like this because a lot of the conversation around you know Wells Fargo is, oh, nobody's there. They're not selling out. What the heck's going on? But uh, at home, the Flyers are 13-2-4. Four. So they've lost six times overall, but only twice in regulation. That's outstanding. That's a fantastic home run. I mean, 26, 30, 30 points out of a possible, let's see, 15, 19, da, 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 38. You know, that's, that's fantastic. And then you go on the road, 9, 10, and 1. So you're getting 19 points out of a possible 40. So not even half. So over the course, think about that, over the course of an 82-game season, you know, they, they'd be at like 40 points on the road. What? If they played all 82? That's crazy. I just, I, I you know, I, I can't figure it out. But uh, a few transactional moves there. Morgan Frost back to the AHL. He had an up and down kind of opening there with the team. Uh, one of the young studs, or excuse me, young prospects, I guess. If he was a stud, he'd still be up here. But uh, he's supposed to be a stud eventually. But they send him back down to get a little bit more seasoning. Uh, you know, cook a little bit longer there in the AHL. And they activated Michael Roffel off the uh, long-term injured reserve. So they get him back, which, uh, you know, he's a pro. Uh, so that will be a slight upgrade probably at the time. It'll just be a matter of how they rearrange the lines. Uh, look out for that tonight to see where they insert Roffel. Uh, you know, whether it'll just be Frost out, Roffel in, or if they do some kind of restructuring or reorganization here, uh, you know, with the lines overall. But the Flyers, they continue to push. Uh, they're looking at, uh, I believe they're currently still in the playoffs here. If not, right on the cusp. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to double check for you guys there just to see where exactly they're at. Because last time, you know, two weeks ago we looked and they were in the division. Now, you know, they're flirting with, uh, you know, missing the playoffs here. But ESPN gives no love to the NHL. They always make me click like two more times instead of trying to just go right to what's going on here. But, um, oh, that's right. We got matinee hockey and basketball today because it's New Year's Eve. Here I am working for you guys. And then the Sixers tip off at 3 o'clock. That's right. But, all right, standings, NHL. We're going to bada bing, bada boom here. And then we'll jump over to hoops for you. But the Flyers, fourth in the Metro, 
49 points. Uh, they've played two more games than the Islanders, who are two points up. So they're a few points out of that third spot, but still in that wild card spot for the Eastern Conference. And, and obviously, playoff hockey is what we're going to need. That's for dang sure. And, and the wild card, Tampa Bay. Wow, look at them. They went from the, the historic year last year. Tampa Bay Lightning scored like the most points in 10, 15 years, get swept in the first round. Now they're not even in the playoffs. What the hell happened in Tampa Bay? I may have to do a podcast on the side just strictly about what the hell happened in Tampa Bay, but my goodness. So, um, all right, transitioning to the Flyers here, wrapping things up. Or no, from the Flyers to the Sixers. Uh, the Sixers beat the Bucks Christmas Day. They had everybody feeling great. They they kicked the crap out of the box. It wasn't even close. I, I, you know, I had family over. We did our thing in the morning. Then my, uh, my wife's mom and brother stopped by early afternoon. Obviously this tip being at two 30, it's like, okay, I'll put that on in the background. We'll kind of, you know, we'll have the music going. We'll check in, check out type of thing. Every time I went in there, they were up like 20 points. They were up 15 to 20. I, I mean, honestly, I, I watched the replay of it, watched some of the film, but live, I didn't see a lot of it as I was waiting for like the fourth quarter. I was waiting to be like, Hey, you know, it's a tight ball game. Let's turn this up now. And even then, and, you know, the, the Sixers got outscored by 15 in the fourth quarter and won the game by 12. So they were up 27 going into the fourth. And I just, my God, what, what an impressive showing from the Sixers. And it, it gets back to the conversation of playoffs versus regular season and how much weight you put on, you know, kind of both styles of basketball. I was trying to figure out how exactly to say it because in the playoffs, it is a different game than the regular season. I mean, they play a little bit tighter defense. It turns into a more of a half court style of basketball. They tend to get back in transition. Uh, they don't make it as, as many high risk, high reward passes. You know, Ben Simmons ain't throwing it all the way down the court type of thing. They're going to bring it up. And, and that's where that's the, that's the style you need to get Milwaukee into obviously because of the Greek freak, you know, he's like Ben Simmons kind of on steroids there and transitioning, uh, you know, finishing in his length around the hoop and everything like that. So if you guys watched the game, you saw out there, there were times where Joel Embiid wasn't even guarding uh, the Greek freak, just daring him to shoot a three-pointer. And and still, you know, he didn't pull the trigger. And, and when he did, 0 for 7 from the Greek freak. So, you know, I have it here. Embiid and Horford, they guarded him for most of the night, uh, went 8 of 27 for 18 points. It was the most field goals he had missed in a game in his career. So, Excellent defense from Al Horford, and that's one of those things, again, come playoff time. Horford used to give the uh, the Sixers an Embiid fits. Well, now he's going to be on our side doing it to the other guys. But uh, as well as shooting the rock, the, the Sixers made 21 three-point field goals, which tied a franchise record. And you know, I had, I had done all the research, talked to you guys in the past about how they can't shoot, they need more shooting. Well, when the ball goes in, man, this team's tough to beat. Uh, 121 to 109. That's that's ridiculous. And and making 21 threes, obviously 60, you know, three points right there. That's over half the points coming from downtown. So uh, a fantastic game by the Sixers that was just wasted. Yeah, I mean, just absolutely wasted the, the next two days. And, and then they go to the Magic, to Orlando, because we are, we're on the road here again. Disney on ice. He's at home. That means the Sixers are on the road, too. And, and they're in Orlando going to Disney's house. They're saying, hey, Mickey, you're coming here. Well, we're going there. And then they lose 98-97. And, and Markel Fultz is out here not looking terrible. Now, his shot is still ugly. My God, is it ugly. But it's going in a little bit more than it used to. So, you know, true. He can't be too mad at it. And again, on the road, Embiid and Harris, they're they strong, but everybody else doesn't really show up. And, and it's just frustrating. It's frustrating to see a team like the Bucs, who are like 28 and four, get just manhandled by the Sixers. And you see, hey, we can do this. We can be Golden State 72 and 10 if this happens, if we make shots, if we play hard. Then you go into uh, Orlando and you think you're just going to show up and win the basketball game and you get beat. And then they stay in the uh, the state of Florida down there. They play their first game in Miami and they had a hell of an ending there. They end up losing 117-116 in overtime. That was the uh, the crazy missed dunk by Tobias Harris there. Uh, then they go down, they hit a three. Tyler Hero, the rookie out of Kentucky, hits a three. Then they get the free throw. Richardson barely hits the rim. Ben Simmons puts it back. They have to go to review. And and, and the Heat aren't bad, so don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not giving the Sixers crap for kind of losing to the Miami Heat. I'm just the overall kind of optics 
of the week of, you know, kicking the crap out of the best team, losing to a poop team, and then obviously playing a competitive game with another really good team. It certainly made sense. But that that Orlando game is the games that just can't happen if you're going to get home court. And you're going to need home court with the way you've been performing on the road. I mean, let's pull up their splits here if I can real quick since I didn't write them down earlier. But we've, we've announced them in, in weeks past and it is not good. So home sixteen and two on the road seven and ten. Both Philly winter teams under five hundred on the road and like the best team in the league at home. Which I don't understand. I don't know if they gotta you know get them in separate beds on the on the road. Maybe we gotta change up our roommates. You know, maybe we can't put Simmons next to Embiid or something. They're playing video games or Fortnite. You know, all night through the wall or something. I don't know, man. Curfew. What the hell's going on? But. Overall, the last 10, your Sixers are 5-5. Five and five, So certainly a, a little bit of a rut here, uh, you know, in the middle of the season as we're 35 games in. So we're coming up on halfway already, which which can be kind of crazy. So no, no alarms are being sounded, you know, nothing again. Basketball very, very much seems to be that, hey, get to the playoffs. Then we'll figure it out from there. We'll change our style. We'll figure it out. Um, two more road games for the Sixers. They play the Pacers in about a, an hour and 15 minutes here at 3 o'clock. Then they go to the Rockets on Friday, followed by a home game with the Thunder on Monday. Ah, Rockets are tough. Thunder's tough. Pacers are tough. So you, w- you would like to see a 2 and one week here, even with two road games. And I know that's something that wouldn't be, wouldn't be great for them. But... Um, we're going to take another brief break here coming up on a uh, quarter of two. Uh, just to, like I said, quick segment there. Once, uh, once the Eagles, you know, wrap up their season, we'll be able to dive into a lot more in regards to those teams. But obviously uh, the birds are dictating the hour here, taking the majority of it. And I do want to wrap up, talk about the rest of the NFL, a little college football here in the last couple minutes or so. Uh, so do me a favor, hang with us out there for a brief break. Another word from one of our sponsors. We'll come back, wrap things up, talk birds and send you guys off to the new year. Hang with us. From the kids to Aunt Sue. Keep your whole family connected on all their devices with crowd-pleasing gig-speed internet from Xfinity. Now that's simple, easy, awesome. Learn more about gig-speed internet or other popular plans now with even more speed. Enjoy faster downloads and a better streaming experience today. Go to Xfinity.com, call 1-800-XFINITY, or visit an Xfinity store for a great offer. Restrictions apply. Actual speeds vary and not guaranteed. And welcome back, everybody, to the third and final segment here of Too Close to Call Sports, your sports talk radio show here at Usula Media and Usula Radio. Once again, I am your host, Kevin Mahalik. As always, I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you so much out there for the interaction, the support on all the social media this year. As 2019 comes to a conclusion... We head over to 2020. I like that better. 2020, 2019. Saves me time and air. Just 2020. Bang, bang. Get it out of here. But uh, the last decade, heck of a decade. What the hell did I do? I graduated college. I moved, I don't know, four times two, three different jobs, four or five, depending on what you're counting as a job, and just wife, kid, house, all the above. And hey, Everybody's telling me 2020 to 2030 is going to be an even better decade. And you know what? I believe I'm out there. We got good things going here at Usula Media, Usula Radio, and we're going to continue to keep the ball rolling for everybody out there listening. So if you haven't already, I bet you have. But, I, you know, it's obligatory, guys. I got to ask you, head to social media, head to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Follow me, kmiho20, kmiho 20 too close to call sports, the number two both times, and Usula Media and Usula Radio, all three of us, because you know there's going to be things on each platform that are going to be independent and different from each other. You know we don't want to flood you guys with the same material on all the different platforms. So uh, you know follow Usula for everything they're doing across all their media, not just sports. You know I'm the sports guy here, but they're doing a heck of a lot of tremendous stuff in a lot of different areas. So stay tuned there. Then too close to call sports, you get funny videos, you get interactions, you get more podcasts. And then with myself, you're going to get a little bit more of the uh, sports reporter kind of feel, some websites, articles, things along those lines. So wherever your interest may lie, follow all of the above. Either way, it helps each one of us tremendously. The likes, reviews, comments, that's how we continue to grow the brand, spread the word, and give you guys the quality content there at home. So just wanted to thank you once again for a tremendous 2019. Everybody here, everybody out there listening, all of the above, behind the scenes, in front of the camera, behind it, everybody uh, just fantastic. I appreciate everything. And, uh, you know, hopefully 2020 
continues to be an awesome, awesome time. So wrapping up the the last segment, the last 10 minutes, under 10 minutes here or so, uh, talking football once again, bowl season squarely underway. You guys are listening to this while probably watching the Virginia Tech-Kentucky game that just went to halftime as the Hokies have a 17-14 lead. But uh, we're going to talk NFL a little bit. First, I wanted to talk coaching jobs, coaching hires. The Carolina Panthers... Cleveland Browns, New York Giants, and Washington Redskins currently with your openings. However, it did just come out. It looks like earlier today it was finalized. Ron Rivera, the former Carolina head coach, he'll just kind of go around the you know the merry-go-round and he'll stop there on the Washington Redskins seat and he'll be the Redskins coach for the next five years. So Ron Rivera, he goes to Washington, safe quality hire for the Redskins. That organization's a mess. They need somebody who's been to a Super Bowl, been a head coach, knows what he's doing. He'll bring stability to that team, that program. Ultimately, I don't know if he's going to bring a Super Bowl, but stability, and, and that's a step in the right direction. You know, I guess on some of these other ones, Matt Rule, he tends to be the, the guy to pencil in for the Giants, the current Baylor head coach. Used to be just down the road here at Temple University before he went to Baylor. Well, he started before Temple actually with the Giants. He started in the NFL world and has NFL roots. And, you know, obviously as a college kid looking to get back to the NFL is the, is the true goal. So I think you're going to pencil in Matt Rule there. The Cleveland Browns, I would bring in Mike McCarthy, the old uh, Green Bay Packers head coach who took this year off. Obviously worked with Aaron Rodgers for years and years and years, had those offenses, high octane, won a Super Bowl, uh, you know, a couple of different stints there where Green Bay was very, very good. Baker Mayfield, uh, Jarvis Landry, Odell Beckham. You can't tell me they wouldn't love somebody, you know, like Mike McCarthy coming in and then slinging the rock around and, and really getting that going. And then the Panthers. I don't know what the hell the Panthers are going to do. I think the Panthers are going to go a little, not outside the box, but uh, probably offensive coordinator style. One of these other teams, the Ravens OC, uh, Josh McDaniels, the Patriots OC, he continues to be talked about. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs offensive coordinator is getting some run again. I don't know why they keep getting chance. I mean, Nagy was the last guy who went to Chicago. The only reason they get picked is because they're coaching Mahomes, and Mahomes can make anybody look good. Mahomes would make me look good as an offensive coordinator. I could be like, hey, go out there, play football. Okay, cool. You're making me look good. Thanks. Like, it's, I don't know. I don't get that. But the other two, maybe the Jaguars, I guess Dallas, you know, that coach, he hasn't been fired, but he's technically not under contract. His contract expired, so they got to hire somebody, whether it's going to be Garrett once again or somebody new. They got to figure that one out. And, you know, there's a couple other there. Maybe the Bears, they don't look like they're going to make a move, obviously. Maybe they should. Maybe they shouldn't. But, uh, you know, certainly discussion. So uh, I wanted to give my two cents on where everybody's going to end up there. Ultimately, the Giants, I don't think that's a bad gig, man, with Barkley, Jones, you know, maybe working for a Gettleman there. The GM could be tough, but eh, it's a good spot, man. You got a quarterback and a running back. So uh, last segment here, talking NFL playoffs, three other games in order. Saturday afternoon, Bills at Texans. Bills are plus three, underdog Buffalo Bill. Second time in the playoffs here in the last two to three years. Uh, they broke that long drought of 15, you know, 20 years. And here they are, two out of three. Really comes down to, uh, you know, Allen, the quarterback, whether or not he can, uh, Josh Allen, whether he can figure it out and, and win on the road in Houston. Because Houston, they have Deshaun Watson, obviously strong, but they have their issues. They, you know, the offensive line isn't great. Their defense gives up a ton of points. A couple of six and ten team or ten and six teams. The reason I said six and ten is because Buffalo six and two away from home, and then you know Houston five and three. So that one's almost a toss up. That line was at three. Looks like it's down to two and a half. So some money coming in on the Buffalo Bills there. Uh, personally, if I had to pick one, I would take Houston at home, given the points. I'm just not trusting Josh Allen on the road in his first playoff game in a hostile environment not to turn the ball over. And basically, I don't think they're going to be able to score with Houston. I think Houston's going to be able to score, and I don't think Buffalo's going to be able to keep up. And in the nightcap Saturday, the New England Patriots, uh, minus four and a half. Well, that's up to five and a half. So money coming in on New England. Nobody's thinking that Ryan Tannehill is going into Foxborough and knocking off Uncle Tom, saying, hey, the dynasty's over. Uh, Tom said, get the hell out of here. No, it's not. I'm just pissed. I got to work on Wild Card Week. Could you imagine that? Tom Brady has to work this weekend for the first time all decade. They literally had to buy the entire, not, not like miss the playoffs. I'm done with work for the year. Just, hey, New Year's vacation. 
like week off. It's unbelievable how they did that 10 years in a row. They're pissed that they're the three seed right now. We're like, hell yeah, nine and seven, four seed, go birds. And they're like, are you kidding me? We got to play on wild card. That's for peasants. Only peasants play on wild card weekend. And honestly, they're not wrong because let me look at this here quick. I took a picture of it. Uh, Super Bowl teams, their seeds last year, 2v2. 2017, 1v1, 16, 1v2, 15, 1v1, 14, 1v1, 13, 1v1. Certainly helps to get a bye in the playoffs here in the second half of this decade to make it. So we'll see. The Patriots, you can't bet against them. Give the five and a half. Even if they lose, I'll wear that because I'm not losing money betting against Tom Brady. It's happened too many times that I just, Tom, you know what? If you lose, you can take you can take my money. I don't care. But you've made, you should be making me money. And then now uh, let's see. Sunday at one o'clock, Vikings Saints eight. Uh, not eight. Uh, bah, 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 one o'clock. Uh, one and four that day. Not a night game. But the Saints were minus eight. And now it's minus seven and a half. So kind of a consistent line there. That obviously means a little bit of money's coming in on the Vikings. People don't think they're going to lose by more than a touchdown. I do. I think the Saints are going to hammer them there. But once again, New Orleans at thirteen and three. So pissed. The Eagles were the one seed at home field at thirteen and three. New Orleans has to play on wild card weekend. Yeah, that's just insane. My goodness. And then obviously Seattle, New England. Uh, let's see. ESPN has it at one and a half. So I don't know. I'm, I'm taking the Seahawks there in the points. That's for dang sure. But it, it's going to be a heck of a football weekend. Hopefully the refs can stay out of it. I mean, last week, you know, we uh, the end game, the Seahawks Niners, only a little bit's on the line. You know, we only have seeding one, two, three on the line, five on the line. So that's only home games for them or them, which means millions of dollars for this city or that city or time off for this guy. So there's only a little bit going on. And yet Al Riveron doesn't want to look at the potential pass interference in the end zone between the Niners and Seahawks because he watched it real time and there wasn't enough there. I'm going, are you kidding me? There's 30 seconds left in the game. What's an extra five minutes? We've been watching football for four months. Okay, it's midnight. I don't care if this goes till 12.05. We've hit the threshold, Al. Don't care. Look at it, man. So that's what the rules put in place for this kind of stuff that happened last year. They're not abiding by it. He said, screw yins. I'm not doing it. So we'll see what happens. But... Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Mahalik here, Too Close to Call Sports, wrapping up uh, another edition here on New Year's Eve, coming up on 2 o'clock. Uh, final word, just wanted to once again thank everybody for listening, sharing out there. Uh, follow me on Instagram, social media, give me comments, react, post. Obviously, I want to hear from you guys. You know, I read a couple of comments today on the air from online. Uh, if you want, uh, you know, your comment read or, or you have something to say, send it to me. I'll get it on air. We'll discuss it back and forth. Uh, certainly make this an interactive type show as we head into 2020 certainly open for feedback how we can improve what you guys are ultimately looking for uh because we're out here for you you know I, I enjoy doing this from my end but ultimately if you guys are you not entertained if you are not entertained then it, uh, this doesn't matter so you know let me know where we can improve we'll do everything we can out there uh but once again thanks for listening thanks for watching have a very safe safe happy healthy 2020 enjoy tonight call uber call lyft don't do anything stupid enjoy yourself stay safe and i will talk talk to you guys maybe this weekend but if not for sure next tuesday enjoy the week out there and we'll see you then peace